my main goal is to have conversations that that open the mind up that that are interesting that are that are timeless you know what i mean and and the world we live in today there's so much fake shit going on so much bullshit and when i met mike we kind of vibe because we we kind of tell the stories that are that are real and genuine um a lot of people would glorify the drug game and you know with my music we don't really glorify it as much as we tell the stories that happen behind the scenes so you know i want to i want to thank you michael for coming out uh, he flew all the way from uh, from Miami here to talk with me today on the round table. And uh, I think it's going to be one of the most in interesting conversations we have in a long time. And that's why I had to be the first conversation. So, Mike, if you could uh, introduce yourself and let the people watching. First and foremost, man, let me uh, let me thank my brother for <clears throat> getting us out here, you know, and and also believing in the cause and believing in the movement, you know, from the gate. Known Burn for a couple of years and... Uh, Stand up guy, got you know what I'm saying? Respect. That being said, love it. I'm back home. Mike, introduce, introduce yourself to the people that are listening right now that don't know exactly, because we haven't even really given you the full introduction. I want you to give the introduction of who you are and just a little breakdown about yourself. All right, well, my name is Michael Corleone Blanco, and I'm the youngest son of Griselda Blanco, known as La Colosas, La Madrina, the Queen of Cocaine. The queen of cocaine. Yeah, I'm basically I'm the youngest member of the Blanco cartel. Now, I know just by watching Cocaine Cowboys 2 and just by seeing documentary and biopics that, sh that you had some time in the Bay Area. Did you grow up here in the Bay Area or did you spend some time in, in Columbia growing up or break down growing up for me a little bit? Break about down growing up, yeah, I'm f I like to say I'm from Medellin, Miami, and Morgan Hill. So, yeah, I was raised in Northern California and I was raised in Miami in the States. Lived in Queens, lived in Medellin for a decade, and lived in Medellin when I was a child, and then later on in my mid-adolescence. You ask me where I'm from, I'm from Northern California, I'm from Miami, I'm from Medellin. So, like, in your younger years, like, you know, one, two, three to six, seven years old, you were in Medellin. North Cal Medellin. Medellin. Medellin yeah. and in Miami. Talk during, to during the second, during the, the second Cocaine Cowboy Wars, when the whole cartel was in in Miami, <clears throat> shit got hot. So even during the wars, half of the family would be in Miami. The other half of the family would be Beverly Hills, San Francisco. And I was hiding out with my oldest brother in the beautiful town known as Morgan Hill. Morgan Hill. Yeah. Now, when you were growing up in Columbia, like I imagine by the time you were born, mom, mom's already had it popping. It was already on popping. She was already getting it, right? She's already in the game full full time. Yeah, definitely. When 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 I was a kid, you know, a couple of years and I guess around the age of five, that's when my brothers uh, took over the cocaine trade from my mother, and they became the family. And obviously, they took over the cocaine trade in the San Francisco area, Oakland area. Was it uh growing up in Colombia? Like breakdown, like. Share some like moments of Colombia, things you remember about there. Like at that age and that time, being somebody who's, I mean, there would be no Pablo without mom. Yeah. Dukes. Like she was really running things. And so when you were born in Colombia in the in, earlier years. In Medellin. Like, yeah, in Medellin. Right, in Medellin and in Pereira. Because <clears throat> my father, my father was from Pereira mm -hmm. and my mother was from Medellin. My, my father was uh, the enforcer of the family, mm -hmm. you know, el artista, the actor. And his family, the, my uncle Paco and my other Tio Diego, which have passed away, except my Tio Paco, he, he was just released from 32 years that he did. So growing up at that time, yeah, Pablo was already Pablo. Everybody was all running shit. It was, it was during the, the part of my mother's career that she was already such an entity that she was Medellin Joe Cartel, but she was the queen. She didn't have to listen to Pablo. Mm -hmm. She didn't have to bow down to anybody because she gave them all their first routes. She All the routes that people were using were basically the leftover routes that Griselda would either give to them or after they cashed her out for the routes. Mm -hmm. So in other words, they couldn't have routes unless my mother got cashed out for the routes. So... The power was different. We always had military security. You know, I'm, I'm not saying, oh, you got security that's military. No. Like the armed forces the was my security. The army, yeah. yeah the Special army. forces. We had local cops. And then my mother's pistoleros, which my father was in charge of. So when we migrated to Miami, 
the original cocaine cowboys were Los Pistoleros, my father. So you had people that was, you know, hired by the family, but you also had the government, like the real army watching yeah. over you. Yeah. That's crazy. I mean, if you think about it, like anyone out there getting money today that's doing what they're doing, I mean, they'll never experience that. That was a time in history that's probably not going to happen again. At least it will, will never happen in the U.S., but break down kind of like going to school, like moving around, going to eat. Was it different for you? Did you know it was different? Did you feel it at that age? Or I'm going to be honest with you. <clears throat> I didn't really experience a social school life mm -hmm. until... California. Until Cali. Yeah, because here's where where we I got to hide out. You know, beautiful house on the lake in the hill. Um, my brother had a condo here in San Francisco. My brother uh, Cheeky had another ranch close by in the hills. And I got to Morgan Hill and I was being deprogrammed. So I went to, a, I wasn't a Blanco in Morgan Hill. Mm -hmm. We were hiding out, you feel me? Yeah. It was my brother Dixon, one bodyguard, his wife and me. So I lived the life of, no, you're not watching Scarface. Today you're watching He-Man. Yeah. And you're going down the street to school. And you're going to ride a big yellow bus. Why? Because this is real life. No mm -hmm. bodyguards, no guns, no killers around, you know, bulletproof cars, nothing. Big four by four trucks, a couple of rich Latino millionaires living on the lake. Psst. Yeah, see, I, when I see pictures, um, especially in like every biopic, I see you and your mom like super close. Like you could tell that like, you know, me personally, I'm a mama's boy. My mom, you know, and that's how I think we bonded when we first met. Yeah, because we both, us, yeah. You know, we, we were raised by our moms with so much love and so much care. And so it's, you know, I, I was always interested in your story. Like, man, I know what it's like to be loved by your mom. But, you know, with her being in the game the way she was, I can only imagine her trying to protect you and keep you away from everything. Your brothers, your brothers were turned up? Yeah. My brother, um, Chiqui Blanco, Prince of Cocaine. Beverly Hills, San Francisco socialite, a local queen pin that was, I won't say her name, but a local queen, queen pin of the San Francisco area was his cougar wife. Kid, uh. was, kid was 17 <laughs> years old, riding around in phantoms, you know, had houses that he just acquired from Eddie Murphy. Um, 17 years yeah, old. Yeah, 17 years old. Professional, three professional racing teams. He was worth $100 million by the time he was 19. He was the third largest cocaine distributor in the world. <laughs> now, Phantom, that, that you don't see that now. Not that nah, young. I nah, mean, you got, you got some nah, nah. psychos out here getting crazy guap, you know? Like, <laughs> what's out here? And some, nah, and some, and some superstars. But let's be honest. $100 at million age, at 19, and his liquid, 19. his cash is, is right there for him. Yeah. It's not like it's a trust fund baby situation. Yeah. When, they, when, when they took the pillars down, in the house that he had bought from an actor, I'm not gonna say his name, the, the DEA agents, they're like, why the fuck does this house have so many pillars? Bomb, they start hitting them, 80 million in the pillars. <laughs> Play with it, 80 million put away in the pillars. Chilling, and that was, that was here in Cali? Yes sir, in Beverly Hills. Hey boss, the boy had 100 M's here in Cali, 80 M's chilling and in the pillars. And that's the pillars, what do you think he had in Switzerland? What did he have in Panama, when Noriega fucking took our shit, you know? So, your brother, your brother had 100 M's at 19. Was he like, did you get to spend a lot of time with him? Did you see him moving mean like that? Like, yeah, man. I mean, Chiqui, like, Chiqui Blanco was that kid from the movie. He moved, he moved like a boss. I mean, he was a prodigy of Pablo. He was a prodigy of Los Ochoas because he was a prodigy of Jorge. Like, they grew up, this little kid's going to be a mobster. And he came out Griselda. Mm -hmm. So he was my mom's prodigy. So the kid was, he was too advanced. My brother died at the age of 26. 26? 26. 26. Did he get killed here in California or? No, Medellin. He was assassinated in La, La Baviera. It was a massacre. It was like 12 people. The hit was for him. And 12 people died that night. Fuck. How old are you when that happened? Uh, I was living here in Morgan Hill. I went to Medellin. I went to Medellin for two months. I turned 14 there, came back a month later, uh, you know, he got murked. Blew my mind, my, my brother was my idol, man. He was that 20 something year old man telling them 40, 50, 60 year old men, you know, he was already getting to be a billionaire and he was, he was a young Caesar and he didn't bow down. 
You know, a lot of people bow down. Yeah, everybody had to bow down to Pablo. Mm -hmm. I'm not saying that, you know, that the man wouldn't give his just corrects to El Patron, but he never paid taxes. And for you to not pay taxes to El Patron, boy, either that Patron loves you or he's just waiting for the day to get something from you, do it to you, yeah. or, or you're Griselda's son and Griselda gave you your first shot. And he respected that. And he respected he that. Respected so I used that. to take letters from Pablo to my mom here in Dublin, Dublin Correctional Facility on uh -huh. a military base. So I used to go, um, Pablo used to send letters to my legal guardian <clears throat> that we stayed here in the city and we stayed in Morgan Hill, uh, Lucia, Chia. And he used to send letters, you know, just giving my mother motivation. You know, you know, Gordita, he would call her Gordita, that's love, you know, and he would, he would tell her, La Doña, Mi Doña. I owe everything to you. And I would read the letters. Come on, it's a letter from Pablo. You have bro. to read it. Yeah, how could yeah, you not no. read it? I'm like, let me read these letters. I'm sneaking them in. Let me read them. So you were showing love to her while she was locked up. Yeah. Did you ever meet Pablo? Yeah, I met, I met Pablo in Miami Beach when I was like, I think I was four, mm -hmm. <clears throat> before my father was killed. He came to visit us at the Palm Island you, you, man, you were just there. You saw those houses on yeah, Palm Island. Yeah. You know the one on the corner that was the Al Capone one? Ours was three lots over. Damn. Yeah, on Palm Island in Miami Beach. And uh, he would visit us there. And that's where my mom had a statue. The good luck statue. Everybody used to rub the statue. <laughs> do, you, do you remember anything about Pablo or was it too young because you were four? No, then I saw him again You know, when he was locked up. Uh -huh. My brother used to visit him every other weekend, Cheeky. Okay. So, when like, he was in his own jail? When he was, yeah, he was over there. I met him once for a brief moment and we left. My brother didn't really want me, to, my mother did not want me to go. Mm -hmm. They're like, yo, what are you doing going? And to me, man, I just, I wanted to shake the hand of Julius Caesar. Yeah. You know? I mean, it's fucking, it's Pablo. You know, so I'm like, bro, please take me with you. We go up there, they take us up in, in, in my brother's bulletproof cars. But once you get there, it's bowed down. So they pick you up three miles down the hill. They put you in a fucking huge, you know, 18-wheeler. That takes all the visitors, all the whores. It takes everybody up, up to the visiting. <laughs> Once you get to the visiting, the military comes out. They see who it is, and it depends on your power. So everybody's waiting in line. They saw Chiqui Blanco with little Corleone. Boom, we cut the whole line. Search us. My, my bodyguard goes in with us. El Escolta, El Costeño. That he was Ochoa's escolta, and then he became my escolta. We go in there, you know, it, it, you're in a state of shock. I'm trembling. I know I'm about to meet Pablo. They're going to hang out in the pool. Pablo was a weed head. So all you smell is that good Colombian, you know? Yeah, because in Narcos, he's always smoking yeah. weed. So you actually seen Pablo smoke yeah, yeah. weed. And, and uh, his little sicarios that roll joints for him. And remember, everybody knew, if you worked with Pablo, you knew what a weed head he was. So people that would use his routes... And he wouldn't even know, would pay him his money and send him a pound from Mexico, <laughs> send him a pound from Hawaii, send him a pound from somewhere. And he was just there smoking and the whole fucking room smelled like that good. So you put up and Pablo was blowing a tree. That's legendary. I'm gonna, I'm gonna have to, I have to light one just because of hearing that. I have to light one up for Pablo. I shook Gotti's hand when he was incarcerated. Who? John Gotti. John Gotti? I shook his hand. He was incarcerated with my cousins. Yeah. What do you, uh, a lot of people, we talked about it earlier, a lot of people glorify the drug game. You know what I mean? They, they glorify you know, all these rappers these days. They rap about it. They're, they're just bragging about it. But, you know, look, I've really been in it for a while and was fortunate enough to get out and find legitimate, like, business and whatnot. Like, Amen. what are some of the, what, what's some of the craziest things you've actually seen? Like, you know, obviously outside of your family, because, I mean, your story alone is crazy. I mean, Having your all three of your brothers were killed, yeah. and on my father's side, uh, one. My father's side. Um, my, on my father's side, uh, we spoke about my other brother Terremoto. He was Pablo Escobar's number one sicario. Yeah, he was killed at the age of seventeen years old. Seventeen. Seventeen. Already had a three M's in the bank. Already had a hundred bodies. They tortured him for a week. They said they brought doctors in <laughs> to keep him alive, bro. That's fucked up. Yeah. What is uh? What's, yeah, so what's can some, I elaborate on that? What yeah, what's some, what's something that sticks with you? Like, look, like that. What you said, like, a lot of people might get it misconstrued that we're glorifying the violence or the lifestyle. And I think 
I think for people in our position, well, first and foremost, on my brand, I glorify the era. Yeah. I glorify this, that. I try not to do too much crazy shit or shit with gun violence or shit like that because I've lived that life. You really lived it. Like you. You yeah, lived your it. life. So you know that us being in our position, we are the victors. Yeah. Nike, you know, victory, homie, because never would our predecessors phantom going legit. And, and you know, when I look at your brand, I know what's going to happen with it because it happened with me. People, people buy into who's behind a brand. People respect real. You know what I mean? And with cookies, the way I look at cookies is people respect cookies because it really is what it is. You know what I mean? Love it. And with, with the Pure Blanco brand, people understand who they're supporting, why they're supporting it, and what it represents. I don't even think people will look into the things that they other people may think they look into. I think they're going to be like, look, this is somebody I really came up in this lifestyle, someone that's really been around, you know, the things that all the TV shows are going after right now. All the, everyone wants to be some kind of involvement with the narco style lifestyle Infamous. documentary. Yeah. You're a part of an era that is so timeless, but I always wondered through your eyes, like some of the things that's like, like happened. For instance, like I read on the internet a <clears> while back that they seized close to $500 million with the, with the property and that it was left to you. Yeah. Is that, is that true? Yeah, it's accurate. They had, um, they had done uh, what they call in Colombia, extension de dominio, mm. which legally they weren't supposed to do or what they couldn't because that law was invented after the Pablo law. Mm -hmm. And most of the properties that we had <clears throat> that were from the 60s, I might add. So Mama been balling since the 60s, Shit. you know, that we had so much real estate that at that time my mother wasn't considered um, a drug dealer. She was a real estate czar. They knew that there was somebody that had started inventing some type of entrepreneur business that, that, that was just making this lady buy up the whole fucking city. Mm -hmm. And... With the years, my mother acquired most of Medellin, the, the high real estate. Everything in Medellin is by zones. So if you live in zone one, it's, you're kind of broke. If you live up to zone five, then you're a socialite. All my properties were zone five. I mean, yeah, and oh, my mother still held properties that she would give to people and, and stuff like that in zone one, zone two. She owned like the she owned the real big real estate out there. Yeah, that major corporations had to acquire her property in order to make malls. And stuff like that. So when my mother passed away, myself, my brother, my brother's kid and myself, uh, we inherited it, a couple of things. And then the Colombian government steps in, you know, those corrupt fucks came and they hit me once, fought it for two years, was able to retain my properties, did what I had to do. But um, third world politics. You know so what I'm you, saying? you were aware when, when your mother passed away that you had these kind of properties. Yeah, or that you were I had them my whole life. So yeah. I was aware what was mine and what wasn't. Yeah. And what was bought in 1970 and what was bought in 1989 because, yo, my brothers taught me how to become a businessman. Yeah. I had to take care of my shit at the age of 14. I was in line with lawyers and telling motherfuckers, no, you're not going to do that. Why? Because that's my property and that's what you're paying me for and motherfucker pay me now and this is the taxes I paid on it, so cash me out. You get it? So I learned the game from young drug traffickers that became businessmen. Yeah, they, My brother because became when you get money like that, you obviously yeah. got to jump in another business and then you you have money to play another business and whatnot. That's, that's actually really hard to even swallow. Look, I've lost, I've lost bread or I've lost things playing with the, you know, the pack game, but 500 M's worth of property. I mean, did they even notify you correctly? Did you have to see it on the newspaper? Like, oh, man. Like, I, I was incarcerated the second time. The first time, <clears throat> you know, everything everything was taken care of. You, if you smell me, mm -hmm. everything was taken care of. So I retain all my properties, everything. I'm back living his life. A lot of motherfuckers think that I, I was born with a silver spoon and, you know, this kid, when you dig into a lot of shit about my family, you see in my family, my mother had a rule. And my mother's rule is, was everything or everything you see around you, yeah, is mine. Boy, go get some and bring some home. So that's why all them boys were getting money. Yeah. And at a young age, you know, I had to get my money. And my old girl always told me, yo, papi, we don't even make phone calls for free. We're Blancos. We charge everybody for something. 
Got to. Got to. Got to. That the feeling when you when you seen that they took all that property because I mean. That shit never goes away, bro. It never dog. goes oh, away, right? Yeah. No, because look, I think about like when I lost a pack. Well, I, fuck them, but it still never goes away, motherfuckers. Yeah, because you I know it's rightfully yours. I hope you never spent a fucking dollar buy a lot of flowers, motherfuckers. It's, it's nuts to think <laughs> that like, not even to leave because you got, you got children now, you know what I mean? And you know that it wasn't, you know the government over there is definitely corrupt for sure. Definitely. It's definitely corrupt for sure. So they was looking at it like a lick. As soon as moms passed away, they was looking at it. So, you know. I, and you I, think that what you just said, the kids, you know, it's yeah. like, all right, so you think that's going to stop me from giving my kids a future. It's never going to stop me from that. But damn, my mama worked decades to make sure that her great, great grandkids would be taken care of. Yeah. That they didn't have to live the life that we did. Well, that's why you buy real estate. Hey, you know? man. It's crazy, Brandon. I'm telling you, listen, third world countries. <clears throat> Colombia, they'll steal anything. What is, what do you think Colombia is like now? Like, is it still? Because I have people that go over there now that that chill and they do documentaries and a bunch of homies go there to fuck. It's with a lot girls. better. It's a lot better. Now. Yeah, like Medellin has been awakened artistically. It's it it has always been a very kind of like the vibe in San Francisco. It's always been a very big culture. Uh, right? Yeah, big culture, big bohemian. A lot of people don't know, but Medellin is a marijuana smoking city. Sure, people be like, no, it's you know, it's the cocaine capital of the world. No, if you do your math and you understand your math, Medellin. El Barrio Antioquia, el, bar el Barrio Santísima Trinidad, was started by bringing Rifa into the, into the city of Medellín. And it was the only neighborhood that had uh, killers, Afro-Colombians, whores, bootlegging, and marijuana. And there was, a, there was a lady that controlled that, and her name was Griselda Blanco. Your mom was in the weed game. That my mama was in the weed game. That's how my mama started. She went to the Andes to get a little strain. What do you think that weed was like? I've smoked it. Yeah. A lot of people smoked it. And to this day, you know, in the 80s and 90s, it was a very popular strain. strain. Uh, I'll, you know what time it is. I'll tell you, you've heard it. Colombian gold. Yeah, no. Stop it. I'm not playing. Colombian gold in the Andes. Griselda would send a hundred mules, and I mean mules, donkeys and mules, and workers up there to go get that that Colombian See, gold. See, that's that's the shit that my pops talks about, that all his friends talk about. Talk about the Thai stick, the Acapulco gold, the Colombian gold. So your mom, I didn't even. Your mom was responsible for Colombian gold before before all the other. Yeah, as a matter of fact, when she took over Queens, New York. With her partner, with El Capitan, with Bravo, they didn't, the cocaine wasn't being crystallized yet. You know, Peruvian was still base, base cocaine. That's where you get crack from, right? Mm. The base of the brick. So, Griselda's first outlets and how they started, what's the, the most that they can get tons of and put it on the captain's boats? Weed. So she started with those guajitos, and a lot of people just shipping, you know, 100 pounds here, and then they got into tons. And then after New York, Florida opened up, and then she would just flood it ah, with Colombian gold, you know, boom, Psh. weed everywhere. And then when she relocated, she went back to Colombia. By the time she had to flee Colombia for being the most wanted woman in Colombia, right, she was still on the run in New York. On a million dollar bond, Griselda was the first woman ever to place a one million dollar bond and told them, keep that shit, I'm gone. And when she relocated back for the second time to Colombia, that's when crystallized cocaine came into the picture. She came back to Miami and then it was like, all right, weed made me a shitload of money, but we already made good money with cocaine in New York. Yeah, let me just flood Miami. Fuck. And she flooded it. I'd be willing to bet that you'd be able to find a seed somewhere floating around the world of Colombian gold. You're, sit, you're sitting next to the right guy. So if you're listening and in 12 to 15 months from now, Colombian gold pops up on the menu, it's not fake, you know? And that's, that's the thing is like, because I've had to go legit. Obviously, you've had to go legit. And we've been blessed now to be in a position, at least through our circle, to be able to sell weed legally right now. And I think if anyone should be in the game, it should be people that have risked their freedom, have lost loved ones, and have really been through this shit. 
There's a lot of venture capitalists jumping in this shit. A lot of weirdos. A lot of real estate guys. They're jumping in. Yeah, you yeah, know, know guys that don't come. know anything about the game. So I'm glad you told me about the Colombian goal because you got my mind spinning Yo, right now. I second the motion, burn man. Yeah, come, come on, on brother. Man. You know we got the distribution, which would, would have been called a route back in the days. <laughs> la ruta, la ruta, hijo de puta, eso, eso paga, mijo. Man, you hear him <laughs> preaching, man. We might have to go ahead and, and dig up and find one of them seeds because I guarantee you they're floating around That's somewhere. That's too easy, man. I'll make a phone call to Colombia. Besides, besides the property that was seized from the family, um, any jewelry, any paintings, anything that's oh, just like man, anything Brando. that's just like fuck. Don't get me started. You know what it is? I was running through my album the other day and looking at my house, the one they just took, fucking two years ago. Those bastards, <clears throat> and um, that was Chiki's house. You know, he bought it from Los Ochos and Pablo. So dope, dude. So dope. Fucking listen. So Pablo gives us, Pablo sells. Because Pablo would give. Like the, the ranch that my brother have, that had that was Pablo's, the one with the soccer field, the one house that he had his daughter's toy room. Um, they would, uh, People would say, no, Pablo gave that to Chiqui. No, Pablo didn't give it to Chiqui. Chiqui cashed him out for it. And then Pablo told him, yo, you don't owe me anything more. Keep the, keep the rest of it. And I guess he owed him another, like, two mans on it, two mil on it. And Pablo's like, yeah, I keep it. It's yours. It was never given to him. He paid most of it. But then Pablo be gifted the two M's that he yeah. owed him. Um, he bought, my brother Chiqui bought from Pablo a painting that was called Bacanal. And I had it on my, I had it on the wall up to two years ago. Fuck. Yeah, that shit pisses me off because and that shit was. That, a, yeah, that's time. That's time. That's real art. You know real what I mean? art. And then I had shit from narco artists in Medellin. <clears throat> there was a crave at one time, like a craze about narco artists, artists that would only make paintings for the wives and for the narco men that wanted a type of artwork, and they would sell their paintings for a million dollars. A painting that in fucking Los Angeles <laughs> would go for a stack, a thousand dollars, because they had the narco clients. Yeah. And my brother Cheeky, you know, he just came home from doing seven, and came home, and two weeks later, you know, sent his first 200. So he blew up, and he just started buying paintings from everybody, and had a lot of shit on the wall from artists like Pavon, that everything that man made was for narcos only. That's Manny. Manny, and they can see that shit too. This, I, man, I'm destined to find one of those art art uh, pieces of art floating around somewhere because you're making art for somebody that you know got a crazy ass bag. I mean, money floating everywhere. They probably were fired up to do that painting, bro. Yeah. And it's never probably gonna happen again. No. Never wild. again, because that time will never come. Yeah. Everything is. Uh, Everything has changed. Even in the third world, I'm sure that there's still cartel. I'm still there's, there's definitely still cartel. There's definitely still... But it, it's not as crazy as it was in the beginning. The beginning was the beginning. Yeah. The pioneer shit, bro. The pioneer shit. Never again. Shit was crazy. You think there's still money flowing around Colombia? Like, do people... Have you ever heard any stories oh, of... Oh, yo, burn, A motherfucker's bro. hitting the old... Listen to me, paisas. Motherfuckers in the hills. You know, they're just next to a tree. They're digging up a hole. And here comes Gacha, el mexicano. The, you know, when I started the routes mm -hmm. to Mexico, he, he was my mom's friend, also partner in the Mexican... Gotcha? Yeah, Gacha. He was my mom's partner. And he gave my mom a million dollars. Uh, <sighs> signing bonus. <laughs> Not like... like Here's a million dollar for your signing bonus for distribution. Griselda, can I fuck with you? Here's an M. Can, will you distribute if I get them across the border to Mexico? Mama said, what, you want California? Yeah. Give me some from Miami, too. Bomb. <laughs> Here's a mil. Thank you as a gift. So to this day, they dig up gold bars. Gacha was the smartest. He didn't do He put all his paper currency into gold. Oh, shit. So, like, yeah. You know, he was like, he was like one of the first narcos at, besides my mother that everything was gold in the house from the toilet. He was on some crazy shit. But he would he would stash all his currency in gold bars and kilo bars. So to this day people dig up some shit. They have to. I mean I'm I'm knowing that if someone killed me all my shit that's you know hidden or buried, no one's gonna know where it's at. Someone's <laughs> gonna find it someday. Somebody's you know I mean? gonna live good burn. Someone's so, gonna find yeah. something. They might find a little weed vacuum sealed in my little capsule too, you know what I mean? That's super old. Um Damn, that's 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 fucking wild, bro. Gotcha. She she have you so you have a do you already have a book out? My book is finished. It's complete. Um we just finished editing it two days ago, as a matter of fact. 
So the book is ready to go. I'm pushing that. And yeah, the book tells the real deal. Like the book, I fill in them holes. You know, you know what time it is. All these people, public record is a motherfucker, all right? Public record, investigative journalists, um, people talking shit, a lot of, of, of law enforcement's records on arrest and shit like that. But when you hear something that fills in the blanks, then you say, okay, that makes a lot of sense. Why? Because all that other shit, yeah, didn't really make sense. There's too many holes in it. So don't believe the hype. You hear a lot of shit in public record about people, especially the Blancos. Yeah, and now my book will fill in them gaps. It's super important. I mean, I mean, I already know that the story you can tell and the knowledge you have, like I said, it's a part of time that will never come back. So I'm juiced to, I'm juiced to definitely fucking read that. Gotcha. Do you already have a title for it? Uh, yeah, we, we got two. We got, you know, in Spanish and English, and I have the English version with the with the, um, alternate beginning. But I have two titles for it. I just can't disclose them. Nah, you, when yeah. it comes, it will be the right time. Hey, I got you with one and, of the first batches. And and I've seen on the internet, too, and we talked about it, you got a TV show coming, too. Yeah, which definitely. Is yeah, oh, everybody, January 7th, which 9 is, p.m. Yeah. Cartel Crew VH1. That's gonna I mean, be. You, you know what, Brent? Man, I'm listen. I'm some real shit. It's a pleasure to be here with this man right here. Real, recognized, real all over the world. I'm gonna tell you something. People think that you can build a brand overnight, bitch. Rome wasn't built overnight. It sure tell was you not like that. And it what sure this man not. has built, and I'm 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 trying to get there. I'm making my way up. But I'm gonna tell you something. When it comes to this narco brand shit. I do this, but I didn't start last night. Not only did I go through trials and tribulations and buried a lot of loved ones, but I did my grind like this, man. Working, bro. And that's, that's the dopest thing for me to see is that, man, look, you're fucking with the media. You got a book on the way. You know what I mean? The clothing brand's about to pop off. We're about to do a bunch of shit. Yeah. We you got, know, we got a limited edition with know, cookies, baby. We got something dope Come coming. get some. Is, are you going to write a movie? Yeah, well, actually, I have a synopsis for the for my book, and I'm in the process of negotiating my my life rights for a motion picture, which I have done previously. But you know how it is in Hollywood, Bern. I gotta tell you. Well, look, man, I can tell you like this, bro. I'm gonna go campaign behind the scenes too because I I need to see a movie by you. I need to hear the stories. Man, the stories never the stories never get old and. And there's one thing about the stories is that they're real, bro. So much, you watch the narco episodes, you watch TV. I mean, I'm sure that there's some facts in there, but you ain't getting the real nitty gritty. I mean, just the story about Pablo smoking fucking, having Sicarios roll up joints yeah. for him. That shit's timeless, bro. Your brother's story is timeless. You know what I mean? Your story is timeless. So, so you know what? Somebody's got to change modern day filmmaking as it is because there's so many gaps that are left off in the essence of, and this is speaking from a criminalistic professional view, there's so much loss in the essence of the character and the funny behavior, the evil behavior, the truth, the real, mm -hmm. in characters that were criminals of their era. Because you can't, you can't build a character off public record. Yeah, no. Nah. What about the funny shit? What about that shit that that motherfucker did when he was geeked up? Yeah. Or what about that that real shit that they had to do to make that money right then and there and they were like Marines at each other's backs? Mm -hmm. What about that shit? You know, they don't tell that shit. I mean, that's why I've had a hard time doing my movie PAX. That's what I was elaborating on. I want to see like, PAX. You know, PAX is hard to do because you allow someone to write this story based on description, but... I'm going to take the time to write that shit myself. When I have enough time to go sit up in Lake Tahoe somewhere and just really digest for a couple months, I have to write the movie because, one, the characters have to be on point. The real stories that make the stories that much more epic. You know what I mean? Like, the behind-the-scenes shit. It's, it's real. really all about that. You know what I mean? Like, how you are breaking down moms having to do something with Colombian gold. That's... that's a, That was a phenomenon. Yeah. No, you know? Yeah. Listen to me. Errors, your error, your error blows my mind. And why does it blow my mind? Growing up in Northern California in the 1990s and seeing the boom of marijuana and, and, and how people were, were just getting to be on a social like plateau of acceptance and that shit. And you know, we did our, I did my shit. I was a jet out here pushing green a lot. And to see what you've done. Designer marijuana, the, the the boom that has been created 
you know, a lot of people don't give credit to people. We got to remind people of our achievements. And that's real shit because you have to be reminded why because because that's life. Yeah, I remind people all the time. Oh, this, this, and that. Listen, what? No, the cocaine game. This, I go. Listen, I want to hear that shit unless you're mentioning Griselda. If you're talking about today's modern day weed fucking wave, that wave burners that wave. It's 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 been it's been it's been a crazy ride on that wave. Man. I want to see that movie. Yeah, bro. the movie. The movie. The movie's gonna come. Can it's I get a role in it, my brother? Man, look, I honestly think you'll be one. Of the, I mean, I think you'll you know? kill a mafia role. Like, honestly, since we, since the first time we met, so absolutely. Awesome. Speaking of movies, you're named after Michael Corleone from The Godfather. Have you ever met any of those dudes? Have they ever reached out to you? Any of the actress in the movie or no, the, nothing? N- oh no, not those. I'm good friends with um. I would say good friends because he wrote a. Sc- a script here. He co-wrote a script that was supposed to be a motion picture about my my mother and my life. Is um Nicholas Pelegi. Mm. Nick Pelegi. Uh, he wrote Goodfellas. He wrote Casino. You know, he was he's that man with Scorsese. He he was my mentor. And as far as storytelling and how criminals should tell the story, like Goodfellas. Yeah. I believe that's my one favorite, of your favorite movies, My favorite right? movie ever. I remember because yeah. I saw on the on the IG when you were watching the day of the day. I'm like, all right, burns on his crime shit. It's, it's my favorite movie because it's one of the dopest mafia movies, but also when I was growing up in Frisco, uh, me and my little brother lived with my dad at the time he was running the restaurant. We lived above studio apartment, me and my little brother, the chef across the way from our restaurant and my dad. So four of us in a studio apartment and we had no cable, no telephone. We had a VCR and the one movie we had that we stole from the video rental place yeah. was Goodfellas. That's the shit. That's all we watched. Yeah. <laughs> That's all we yeah. watched. You just, you just like made me go nostalgic. I'm fucking in Colombia, stashing out on my on my brother's ranch, and all I had was a VCR with God rest God, God rest his soul. My best friend uh, El Gringo that started my my click in Medellin, the office in Medellin. He had given me a fucking cassette tape, Aliens, Bloodsport, and Goodfellas, <laughs> and I would watch that shit every day because you couldn't reach cable up in the mountain. Yeah, nah, he was in the cut. Yeah, it was in the cut. Bloodsport's a good one too, though. Yes, I love Bloodsport. Um, is, is it true that is it true that your mom was buried in a gold casket? Yes, sir. That's the hardest shit I've ever heard. That was the hardest shit I've ever heard. She was buried in a in a gold casket. Um, the media was stopped at the door by the common folk and young shooters and great, great, great God children of Griselda and said, no, you're going to respect our godmother and you're not going to film her in here because this is only for the family. And um, <clears throat> what's crazy is that my, organiz- my organization in Colombia that I used to be a member of, the same people that helped me bury my brother, Piti, Uber, that helped me bury him, that carried the box of my brother to the grave, carried my mother to the grave in a gold casket, along with the common folk and the young men of El Barrio Antioquia, where the Medellin drug cartel originated. They carried my mother into the grave. That's crazy. That's crazy. Do you feel like, do you have any sense of paranoia now, like just from being in the game or? Oh, damn, Brandon. Brent, we chill. Yeah. You see how I move in Miami. I see how you move, you know. We always on our P's and Q's. Sometimes I move like a unit. Sometimes I don't. My mother taught me to be a chameleon. But um, I'm always on my P's and Q's, but fear don't live. Fear don't live here. Like my mother used to say, I can no exist el miedo, papi. I can no hay cobardes. My mother used to say, fear don't live here. Ain't no cowards here, buddy. And you know what? I'm covered by the blood of Jesus Christ, man. You know what I'm saying? Listen, I know what I've done in my life. I know what my family did in their life. But if I was to run around places like a scary bitch... You then never I'd, live. You know, you know fuck yeah. that. I'm here to live. I lost all my loved ones. Yeah. They're dead and gone. You're living gone. for them. You're living for them. I'm for living sure. for them. And I'm going to make sure that my children that I have right now live life. That they go on vacations. Like, the vacation I'm out here, I came to chill with my dog, Burn. I came to see my people in the Bay, Morgan Hill, you know, chilling out here with one man from Wake and Babe, 710 Mob, you know, and I'm out here just to show love and to what? Live life. So I'm not gonna live life scared, Burn, dog. Can, right. bro. Fuck that, nigga. We out here. We out here chilling. You know? And, you know, I think, like, 
me, I always feel targeted. Like, I feel like just because all the eyes on me from, from the Wii game and from actually playing around in the game before the legal game, you know, I used to always feel targeted by the... And I still feel targeted by by feds or oh, cops yeah. or the extra hard on for me. But lately, i just been like, bro, I've been so on my shit. That you don't even... Just bring whatever. that as a factor yeah it doesn't exist like what, know, what Jay-Z say yeah doesn't it's like exist. bro like I'm on my path right now I'm on a good one right now and I'm focused and I'm sure you have people bother you like me people come burn what's up with a hundred pack what's up with a box let me let me get something thrown. I know you got the line like bro I'm not trying to hear none of that like yeah. if you talk to me like that bro you're definitely gonna get blocked shook and ducked every time I see you I, I, I'll punch a motherfucker in his face. I can't punch you now because I'm on network television. <laughs> but trust me, don't come too close because we, we I can't phantom that type of talk. Yeah. Yeah, why? Because I'd be disrespecting my children. I'm a corporate man. I'm a businessman. You're going to win. And we're going to get this we're going to get this movie in motion, bro. I already I already know because I well, I don't even think it should be a movie. It should be more like a like a it should be a series. It should be some kind of like a a TV series because the stories that live from everything. If you think about all the different, I mean, your story alone is nuts. Yeah. But if you attack your brothers, oh yeah, and stories. you hit you hit every story around. Oh, it's incredible. Your brother definitely deserves a Yo, story. For vice, sure. ver, vice versa with Pax. Yeah, like I know a little about a little bit about production. Yo, Pax blows my mind. That could be something that could be global because it was global. Yeah. Yeah, on some it's real global shit. and it's rel- it's right now too. You know what I mean? Like if if we hit packs now, if we get it done now, it's gonna be amazing because no one's ever like it'd be a like picture if there's a movie about prohibition while alcohol was just being legalized. You know what I mean? Yeah. So if you do it with the weed and we hit it, it can be big. And the truth. Yeah. Because real people don't want to hear that bullshit, man. I don't want to hear what you thought you were Remember doing. Remember Savages, that oh movie? Oh my God. The worst ever. They portrayed some lady to call her Madrina. i never seen the lady in my life. Ever. Ever. Yeah. They, there's a lot of fake, uh, you know, bullshit on TV these days. But look, we're going to take a break. I think we got some, uh, some nice uh, Puerto Rican food out there waiting for us. We're going to go take a break and uh, we'll be back in a minute. We're back. We had a little. Uh, a little Puerto Rican food for lunch, sparking up a joint of some London pound cake. I'm here with my brother Michael Corleone Blanco. You know, probably one of the dopest interviews you ever hear on the round table. We call it the round table because we chop game, we sit down, we talk about real life things. Um, we're talking about weed earlier. I mean, the fact that your mom, Gazelle Blanco, is behind Colombian gold is epic to me. And we're smoking some London pound cake. Medellin, obviously, you know, you watch Narcos, you see Pablo smoke a weed. You told me that Pablo was actually a connoisseur, which is which was actually pretty dope to hear. Yeah. Pablo smoking all different kind of weed. I mean, that's what I always imagined and wanted to picture. I didn't want to picture him just smoking some bullshit. Yeah, always smoking fine. Did yeah. You, have you seen El Patron del Mal? No, nah, I haven't. If you see a sopa, he's always blazing the whole soap opera. And so he's, and, but it's good to know he's blazing flavors, though. Like, as a big weed head, like, Pablo, you know, Hawaii. Pop- yeah, yeah, he, he was smoking. smoking crazy shit. What's some of the other weed that floats around like Colombia? Like, were you old enough to to know about it? Definitely, when you was on- man. Listen, like the Blanco family transcends time, generations. You know, it's crazy because I I'll tell stories of real shit that I saw happen. In two different times, it's crazy, right? Because then I remember smoking mango biche, right, which is a green mango, right? Mango biche, not ripe mango. Punto rojo, red point, in New York City, and <laughs> Colombian gold in New York City, right? Yeah. And then fast forward when my brothers were released, and me showing up in the '90s in Medellin, Antioquia, my mother's neighborhood. El Barrio Antioquia is considered the weed capital of Medellin. We need to get out there. Yo, but listen to me. When you, like, now, because there's a lot of designer marijuana, you know, uh-huh. everybody that we spoke about, the Creepy Kings, um, Amsterdam boys that went to from Medellin to Amsterdam, came back and they started the designer weed craze in the um, <clears throat> late 90s, early millennium in Medellin. That's where it's at, El Barrio Antioquia. Back in the days when I went back home, after my brothers were released from federal correctional facilities and they started trapping, or should I say internationally drug trafficking, I remember going to buy packs of um, Punto Rojo and Mango Beach when you feel like you, you're smoking designer weed, but it's not. It's 100% natural from the Andes. Mm. Crazy. Because I'd be willing to bet that like the strains out there 
that's floating around Colombia. If you were to grow them inside, you know, you do it indoor the way they were growing the shit that we're smoking at, there's got to be some heat out there. I mean, if you think about it, all the shit that we have out here, a lot of people went and found in different places, you know, where Kush is rumored to be, you know, originally from and things like that. Like, I bet you some of that shit out there is really smoking, though. Yeah. Did you ever smoke? You So you smoked that weed. You smoked weed from Colombia while you are in New York. And in Colombia, yeah, of course. And in Colombia. Yeah. And, oh. then, and then weed from Amsterdam in Colombia. How old were you? What was uh, how um, old were you the first time you smoked? Uh, damn, I'm going to tell you the truth. Honestly, my brother Dixon... And Negro, he was a pothead. He was a hippie rock and roll star. So my mother would let him sw- smoke weed in the house and not in the streets. Mm-hmm. So my mother would always say, listen, what marijuana, you boys smoke it in the house, you know, in whatever mansion we were in. I prefer you guys smoke it here than in the streets or in the clubs. Smoke whatever you want. Just don't do any other drugs. That's how my mom was. Yeah. Like when I got caught smoking weed in middle school, my mom was like, I'd rather you be here at the house, safe, not getting in trouble. My house was like the hangout spot. All yeah, my yeah. homies would always come to my house. You know what I mean? We don't. They'd always come to my house, and we we blaze at the house. We kept it really just mellow. You know what I mean? Of course. Inside. Yeah. So Mango Beach, Punto Rojo, smoked a lot, and then in the '90s in Colombia, then we got like I told you, the designer marijuana. Was it? Was it like? Did it have seeds? Was it green? Was it fire? Like, do you remember? Like, did no, it taste no super sen- good. No sense. Um, I mean, sense of, like. It, it didn't have any seeds. It was already Amsterdam creepy, mm-hmm. you know, hydroponics creepy. And my neighbors were known as the creepy kings yeah. of Medellin. So they brought sh- strands from Amsterdam that was cycle and they created basically what you've done nationwide. Mm-hmm. They did that in the small city of Medellin. So now if you was a boss, you weren't smoking Mango Beach in Punto Rojo. Yeah. You were smoking some shit, some creepy or some Superman, something from Amsterdam and you were paying 20 to 100 times as much. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Definitely. Like in the, in, in the life that you've lived, with your brothers having that kind of money. And I, I know what it's like to have older brothers or brothers in general. And with your mom being who she was, were holidays, like, did you ever get to enjoy, like, the success of that money or was it always kind of moving around? No, definitely, man. My mother made Christmas a movie. Movie, right? You know, like my partner Magic says, you yeah. know Magic. Yeah. A movie. Yeah. Oh, man, mama would give bricks to her nephews. Wrapped bricks <laughs> when they were going for 50. And little Michael here, I'd had a, a Porsche go kart, red Mercedes go kart, white Mercedes go kart, a um, couple motorcycles, and name it everything. Name, tra- name the toy, and this boy had it. And name a character, I had the small version and the human size version. <laughs> <laughs> That's hard. So you were able to, you got to enjoy a little bit of that before, you know. Before whatever happened, Definitely. happened. My brother Cheeky um, used to take me and um, his 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 fiance son here in the city, and in San Jose, the Toys R Us, right? Mm-hmm. And then we and then sometimes in Beverly Hills we'd go road they'll drive to this toy store, but here in the city we used to go to a toy store. I forgot the name. F A O Swartz. Yeah, I think it was Swartz in downtown, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And we used to go that, and my brother would have the people follow us and shopping carts, and he would say, "There's four of them, load them up." And as we came outside, the Rolls Royces would be there, and then the conversion vans for the toys with Rivy, <laughs> with the bodyguards. And my brother used to say, "Yo, listen, spend it till it's gone. That's what you know. It's so para usted. This is for you guys to enjoy. You guys deserve it. You know, you you guys ain't mobsters like us. So reap." What we work for, ball out. Cheeky man, he he lived, bro. That's that's Manny, bro. And if if he was doing it like on the Christmas like that and coming through for y'all, what's the craziest thing you've ever seen him purchase or that you heard about Damn, him purchasing? I saw him. Um, I saw him crash a Lamborghini, leave it there as it caught on fire, forget about it, and then the next day have the same white Lamborghini Countach. I saw that. I saw him. Um, we had a gun range. The, the biggest thing I saw my brother purchase that I could say, wow, this belongs to my brother, was the ranch right down the street from Michael Jackson's Never Never Land. And my brother and Michael were good friends. So the ranch that we had down, down the area of Never Never Land, my brother had a private shooting range, right? So check this out. He hangs out with Michael. Michael Mike, Jackson. Michael Jackson. Huh. Right? The guy with the white glove, right? <laughs> so Shit. check this out. So Michael Jackson's got a whole bunch of black bodyguards. My brother Cheeky, he's from Miami. He's moving out here to California, 
And you know, he digs my brother my brother Chiki was the first Colombian cartel member to actually sell drugs with Afro Americans. And that's a fact, all right? So he starts making this money and he sees Michael Jackson got a hundred, you know, three ring security guard. Like, so he tells all them at Michael Jackson's party at the ranch, how much does Michael pay you? And they tell him the price, and Chiki says, I'm gonna double it. You guys start tomorrow. So next day I wake up at our ranch and I hear this M16 going off. Boom. I'm talking about the M16 from Scarface. My brother was practicing the grenade launcher. No. And I'm like, oh, Chiki, Chiki, the grenade. Remember, I grew up around this shit in Colombia, right? Yeah. So I run out to see them hitting the mountain of dirt that he had the the tractors put together the day before. And he's hitting it with the grenade launcher. And I come out. And most of the guys that are there, the the Latin guys always around Chiki are there. But it's like 20, 30 black guys. And they're all huge. So I asked my bodyguard, yo, who are all these guys here? And he goes, oh, that's Chiki's new bodyguards. And he's like, yeah, he bought them yesterday from Michael. <laughs> <laughs> that that, uh, <laughs> that kind of, that I never would have imagined that, like, you know, I thought he was going to say something like the boy had a crazy, like, dime, you know, diamond uh, something. Or, you know, the boy, man, the boy bought a house. How old was he when he did this? 18. 18 years old. Play with that. Bought a house next to Michael Jackson. Knew Michael Jackson. Yeah. Bought his security, popping the guns from Scarface in the backyard. Dated everybody. He was, he was ahead of his time. He was the prince of cocaine, and his his mother was John D. Rockefeller. His mother was Griselda Blanco. So he 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 lived and left the luxury, and his mother told him, "Yo, you got balls. All right, take over." And he took over the routes. Next thing you know, he was 15, sent his first 100 bricks. That's all I'm going to say. <laughs> did he ever have any, like, did your brother ever buy any crazy-ass animals? Did you, did you guys have, like, in if the you guys were on the ranch? Yeah, like- in the ranch. And um, in, in this ranch, he had uh, some thoroughbreds that one was the offspring of a Kentucky Derby winner. But in Colombia, on the ranch that Pablo gave him, he had um, white Bengal tigers, or he mm-hmm. had some Bengal tigers. And my mother's the one that taught us that because in all our houses in Florida, mm-hmm. she always had royal birds, royal birds and monkeys. I had a monkey that died, and she always had um, a lioness, not lions, but female lions. Mm-hmm. So Chiki... Chiki, when I got to Colombia in 1992, after he was deported, 1991, my bad, <clears throat> um, we go to that ranch. I got off the plane and went to Pablo's ranch, right? And uh, I you saw want the airplane? The, or no? No, no, no. That's Hacienda Napolis. Okay. No, the ranch that my brother had just acquired from him. Okay, got gotcha. you. And we go there and uh, I see these bamboo cages right outside the guest house. Not even the main house. The guest house where everybody's partying at, right next to the nightclub. Because Chiki put a nightclub on it. There wasn't a nightclub, but Chiki said, I want a nightclub. On his ranch. On his ranch. <laughs> so he bought the nightclub and everything. And he had all the fixings made out of gold. Yeah. Golden. Like all- the walkway that separates the VIP was all gold, real gold. You know, 22 karat. All that. My brother was on. He was he was cycle with it. God. Yeah, you know, he was a stunner, bro. He learned from his mom. And um, um, I see what, they, what he has in it. And it's tigers. And there's little tigers running around. With a mama tiger, and there were uh, Bengal tigers. But he was about that. He had monkeys. He had a lot of shit. You know, I mean, that was very popular in Medellin and, and during during Pablo's era. That's yeah. fucking nuts. Yeah. When we were talking uh, at lunch, when we were outside having a little break, um, you mentioned something, and um, I didn't want to bring it up earlier, but you brought it up. You know, with me, as far as my dad, my dad... I didn't get close with him until after my mom died. When my mom died, I became close to my dad. He moved in with me, and now I was, you know, there for my daughter and and there for, you know, me. And it was crazy. I never imagined to be close to him. And you said something that kind of like, I damn near almost teared up when you told me this outside. You told me that your pops was killed in front of you. That's that's not something I ever heard. That's that's what happened? Yeah. I guess that's, that's what drives me to be, like, a good father. That's... Well, that's why I believe I'm a good dad. And, you know, dad, if you're listening to this, I love you. But, you know, my dad wasn't there for me. And that's what makes me, like, if you ever notice, 
I'm always in a rush to get home to my kid. Yeah, and you're always I'm, with your I'm daughter. I'm always with my daughter because I didn't have that. Bro. I remember you know I mean? when I remember when um my child was gonna be born and I had DM'd you, and I'm like, yo, Burn, I'm about to have this little girl. What you think? And you're like, yo, it's about to change everything. My bad. So I was like, you had told me something. You're like, it's gonna make you. Pre-. And then the baby was born, and I told you, yo, Burn, you were completely right. It's much different because I only had boys. Yeah. And it made me change my outlook and. Yeah, it was hard. That's why I'm there for my boys and my daughter because um, my fa- I was my mom's prince, but I was my daddy's best friend. Yeah. So to see the old boy get murked in front of me and the fact how it happened, which is very shocking. A lot of people documented. They say it happened this way. It happened that way. But <clears throat> them, sh- them bullets flew out. While I, I was being hugged by him. So, like, a lot of people say different shit. I'm here. I'm here alive because of God's good grace. And that was, that's, that's the beginning of the movie, which features in my book. And it's just a, a crazy life, Burn Dog, because, you know, like, yeah, I saw the old boy murked right in front of me. And I guess when I was growing up here in Northern California, mm-hmm. I guess that's why I was such a savage. Because yeah. I had already felt that violence before. So I'm like one of the only Colombians in a Mexican crew, you yeah, know? Yeah, nah, Northern yeah. California, I mean, for those, you know, that, that aren't familiar, a lot of people just picture San Francisco, cable cars. I mean, the Bay Area is definitely about that business. Thick. You know, and growing up out here in Northern California around a bunch of Mexicans, I can only imagine, you know what I mean? It's especially what you've been through. And, and that's not something easy to deal with I even now. I love my Mexicans you know I mean? because, you know what, the Colombian and the Mexican culture, even on this VH1 show, Watch the show and you'll find out, you know, you see the similarities of our cultures mm. and why we're so metal metals and why everybody's, you know, el mas chingon because it's so similar. And, you know, the Mexican culture has so much heart. So it's to be respected. So I guess, that's you know, growing up in Cali, you see some shit that you don't see nowhere else. And then you go to Miami and grow up in Miami and you see the savageness of... um Go-getters, mm-hmm. but a different type of go-getter. You know, it's a different type of trip because you see the Griselda shit over there. You see that, what well, we are pirates. We get millions, like, on some cycle shit. You know, I'm talking about 80s mentality. Mm-hmm. So it's different. But the mentality from the Bay and from California that my brothers helped me to understand was a blessing in my life because I understood what it was to be a businessman around people that are to be respected and to enjoy life on, yeah. on a hippie type of shit. Yeah. You know, peace and love in the Bay. And that's what I learned growing up out here. You know, with yeah. every, with everything you've seen, like the things you've been through. And I got to say, bro, you've probably been through some of the craziest shit I've ever heard. And and again, I, w- I just want to thank you for taking the time to come out here to talk with me because these are the things I'm passionate about. And, you know, bonding with people and, and sharing experiences. And, you know, a lot of people think life is all about some things, but... You know, life is about sharing experiences and, and knowing what happened in the past and, and just coming across good people. And so when we linked, it happened on such an organic, natural way. And then we kept in contact as friends. So to come through for me on my first you know, podcast, I've never done this. I really appreciate it because it's been something I've always been curious about in the conversation. We could talk for seven hours and we wouldn't get bored. Just like when we were chopping game in Miami, we chopped game for hours and it was it was a really good conversation. Yo, it's been you know? it's been nothing more than an honor and a pleasure, and <clears throat> on some real like on some real homeboy shit. Going back to how, how we linked up and everything, you know, real recognized, we all over the world. So I appreciate you for having me, my brother, and and it's good to be back. So with everything that you've seen, Mike, like, and I know you got the book, and I know we we're, we're definitely gonna collab on a bunch of clothing stuff with the clothing brand. You got a show coming. You got some children, you know, you got a, a wife that you're happy with right now. Like, what would you say, what is your goal right now? Like, what what's, an, what's what would be the best possible outcome, the best move for you? What's something that you're thriving to get done? Like, what, what's your ultimate goal right now in life? Man, multiple avenues, you know, multiple ver- revenue streams, multiple happiness bro when it comes down to it you're not, now the money in the world is going to make you happy but it might give you the key to open the door that make you happy it's not only about the money I, to seek the meaning of life burn you know to be enlightened man I've had so much better in my life that it don't make me break me I love it don't don't get me wrong about my money but 
to enjoy my life with my children, big dog. Yeah. To to be able with be with them kids and tell them kids, yeah, you're going to Harvard, you're going to Yale. You know why? Why? Because you deserve it. Because what? Because I didn't. Mm-hmm. But now you do. So reap the whirlwind. Go. To to go on vacations with them to enjoy life. That's that's what I'm seeking. And that's 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 exactly what I wanted to hear, man. You've been through a lot of shit. You're genuinely one of the coolest dudes I've ever met. You know what I'm saying? Vice versa, my and, brother. Uh, you know it's nothing but love from this I, side. I hope to see a lot of film with you, man. Like, not only do you have great stories that I think you could you could tell and write, but, you, bro, you'd be crazy behind the camera, bro. I could already tell, man. Hey, you know, hey, we, I mean? you know we're on it. You yes, know what sir. time we spoke about it. We're yes, on sir, this man. One. Well, look, please make sure you look out for everything he has going. You want to let him know the Instagram if they're tuned in, they want to follow Check up. Check me out. Michael Corleone Blanco, pure Blanco. Um, check out my ventures in, in the TAC community, in the DAB community. 710 Mob Official, Wake and Vape, La Madrina Collection. Be on the lookout for, for that cookie stain, baby. Oh, man, Ooh. I'm telling you, hey, look. Be on the lookout. I got two words Colombian gold. Oof, Ooh, we all want it. It's, it, it's going to be a wrap, dude. We're going to do something big, Mike. I'm telling you, the vibe is there. It's there. I'm going to shout out to Magic. Yeah, shout out to Magic. Shout Look, out Magic. to my ace, man. Magic, we got some business to do. Yo, the email is, the email is going to be in your phone in about two seconds. Send me something. I'm going to send you something. Let's get to work. Shout out to my brother, Magic. Be for blessed, real. Mike. We'll see you tomorrow, my broski. Oh, no, I'm going to the cookie Christmas party, homie. I'll see you on <laughs> Monday. <laughs> Yes, sir, man. Much love, Michael. Appreciate you, man. Appreciate you. We real. If you like the podcast, make sure you subscribe. Available on all platforms. 